So I think there was a there was a question in the chat. It's a great question from John, wondering um, if their N95 masks are effective for gases. And I um, would say, uh, from my perspective, they're probably not going. They're they're not going to do anything because gases are so small that they'll pass freely through those N95 masks. I think Trisha there made a nice comment too, though, that there are some masks or respirators that might help in those circumstances. So I think a respirator would, it, it would of course um, be helpful. And then they do make some masks that have some cartridges that allow for absorption of some of the contaminants before it passes through to where you breathe. So those could also have some ability to reduce that. But again, sometimes those car cartridges are gas specific. Uh, there's maybe some more generalized ones. I, if someone has more information, I am not a, definitely not a mask expert, but I, I think what I've shared there is um, accurate. Great, thank you, Becky. Yeah, we do like to learn more about like, you know, mask and how it would affect this uh, operation for our worker safety. Um, I think we probably can put more information like, you know, as a group, uh, group effort in the future. Um, any other information we can add to this? Devin and Carol? I don't have expertise, so I'll let Dr. Larson's comments stay there. <laughs> awesome, understand. I think maybe we can work with Leslie and put some more information with this topic in the future webinars and the future discussions. Just a quick point though, that um, I believe AgriSafe has a nice fact sheet on, on the right mask for the right job. I'm not saying it may not answer your questions, but it does give you an overview of, of um, what type of mask you want to wear with, you know, if you're putting pesticides on or if you're working in, you know, livestock facilities. So that would be one place to do that. I can look it up and see and put it in the chat. Okay, sounds great. Thank you, Carol. Awesome. Great question and a good discussion and give us some more uh, ideas for the future webinars. So thank you. Um, any other questions we have? like 10 minutes, I think. Uh, if anyone has a uh, related question for our great speakers, we have like a general um, safety related to animal feeding operations and manure management and uh, uh, animal mortality and uh, toxic gases. And for a long time, we haven't, uh, as far as I remember, we haven't talked about this like a zoonotic disease for our worker safety. I really think that today is a good time for us to do have some discussions. Any questions? Uh, we would love to learn more about this with our great speakers. Just at this moment, I was just wondering like uh, um, Devin and Carol, um, I think you guys are one of the 11 um, ag centers, ag safety centers, right? Yes. So I wonder how you guys work with like, you know, other centers like, you know, can provide this more information to help like, you know, this group, because, you know, we are the LPELC, we work with a lot of like uh, animal uh, feeding operations and uh, there are certain centers, they don't have so much emphasis or not. I'm just trying to learn this, like how you guys can provide more information to this group and to the people we work with. Yeah, that's a great question. We do work closely across the nation with the other ag centers and Carol, I'll let you fill in um, my many gaps. I'm sure that I will lead. I will put a um, link in the chat to all of the other ag centers. And I believe there are actually 12 now with the new funding cycle, which is fantastic. Um, and yeah, every center focuses on kind of the focuses of the region. So what the region needs, that's why we have regional centers. Off the top of my head, I don't know that we have another center that's focused on manure um, management processes. Carol, do you know? You know, nothing that comes off the top of my head. I would say that any of them that deal with animal agriculture um, and the big ones would be um, the, the high cost center, which is the High Plains Intermountain Center, which is out of, based out of Colorado State. That would be possibly one that would deal with manure. But, you know, of course, as Devin mentioned at the beginning in 2018, this was an emerging issue for us. So it, um, it's somewhat new for, from an occupational safety and health standpoint. Um, the other option would be, or the other center that I think would have some information on manure would be the Great Plains Center, which is at the University of Iowa. 
and they've done a lot of work with um, manure pits and the foaming and that type of thing to how to protect yourself from, you know, the gases surrounding manure. Wonderful. Oh, that's really helpful. The only thing I would add to is because we're regional, um, if you are in one of the center's regions, you can reach out to us or to those people directly. And I know that they'd be more than happy to chat with you about the resources they have or anywhere across the nation, or if they want to work with you to develop those. So that's kind of what we do. Very nice. Thank you. Um, we got some uh, more information in the chat, uh, Carol and Devin shared. This is amazing. So Devin, um, you mentioned that there's like, you know, the, the CDC has like, you know, new information for like new centers. Do you think there's like any center has like a specialty or focus on like a zoonotic disease? Because this is like a timely issue. Like, you know, we have disease outbreak. We even have certain things like a punky marks. Uh, I mean, monkey pox, not punky marks. Uh, so is there like a something maybe we can work together? I'm just like, you know, as this group we're speaking here. Yes, I mean, I think off the top of our head and just because we are UMASH, we definitely have a zoonotic disease focus. Um, as Dr. Ellis mentioned, the kind of one health concept is something that I mentioned is been the core of our center since the beginning and we actually have a research project that's been going on the last two funding cycles with the Minnesota Department of Health doing surveillance for those zoonotic diseases um, in ag workers um, and one of the main findings of their study that we really like to highlight is that um, ag workers are eight times more likely to have a zoonotic enteric infection than people in the general public in Minnesota. So um, this is definitely something that's affecting this population and we would love to work with you to address it. I think I don't have a more of an answer other than yes, this is more and more of a problem every day, climate change, all of these things. Yes, and maybe Dr. Sure. Ellis would have something to add if, I don't know if you work with um, any ag centers near you. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a number of them and obviously Texas a and we've got an uh, Institute for Infectious Animal Diseases. We have a One Health uh, focus through our college or school of veterinary medicine and um, we'd be glad to help as well and it's a it's an ongoing issue and and even right now like I said with the high path avian influenza outbreak it's not only an animal disease but there is a, a zoonotic component is that that as well and, and it's uh, veterinarians are at the forefront really of the awareness and as I said you may have to remind your medical doctor about the fact you work for animals but veterinarians get it and so I would just say we at Texas a would be more than glad to help as well, Zong in the future. Great, I think we have a good idea. Where shall we go for it? So thank you. Uh, at this moment, I do want to ask our speakers, do you guys have like, you know, any questions you usually like, you know, people come to you and then like frequently ask questions you want to share with our, our audience and at this moment? I, I just reemphasize, I, I said it, but I want to say it again, that in an agricultural setting, uh, commercial swine, poultry for sure, but even uh, dairy and feedlots, any concentrated animal feeding operations, if you want to make sure that you're minimizing the disease transmission between animals or between animals and humans, organic material, manure, the things that folks on this call work with every day, that's the, that's the risky uh, agent. You have to remove that. So you can spray all kinds of disinfectants, but if you don't get a clean surface first, you're kind of wasting your time. So always remember that the, you want to have a uh, less of a chance of tra transmitting the pathogens or having a clean uh, area, get rid of the mud and the manure and the bedding and the dirt, and then spray your disinfectant. The chemicals won't do it by themselves. In our exploratory nature of our study, we I've tried to answer our frequently asked questions, but more we have questions for you and for this group. So, you know, if you have ideas for how we can better support the especially those fatigue and long hours that are faced by manure applicators, that would be my question to everyone. Please do reach out to us. Um, but Dr. Larson, you might have some better, better frequently asked questions than we do. I would say the, the questions I get most commonly are like, which, uh, which particular alarms or personal safety equipment should I pick? And that's a hard question for me to answer because I don't know everybody's individual circumstances. But I would say what I always try to remind people is 
the fact that you're thinking about it, that you can make a risk plan, understand what the risks are, and then pick the things that are most appropriate for you. So if, if it's hydrogen sulfide is your biggest concern, um, you know, there's a few little different ones. Google searches can help you look at what those are. Um, price ranges are really the things that are going to set you in one particular category versus another. You know, in the hundred dollar ranges are those little individual gas monitor. You're getting into the thousands of dollars of cost if you're getting into multi gas monitors. Um, there's also also in place monitors you can use if an area is commonly of risk and you want to be warned outside of it. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, I, I don't like to pick one particular technology. Just understanding um, what the what the what the thing you're purchasing measures and how to use it most effectively. So our fact sheet that I posted before has a lot of details about the different types of, of things and what they measure. Um, and then I would say the individual um, companies selling them will give you information to really understand how to use the whatever you decide to purchase. And so that's really important. <laughs> read, I know not reading the owner's manual is not the most fun thing to do, but uh, you want to make sure that it's working properly and that you understand how everything's going. So I think that's all I, the question I get most commonly. Very true. Yes, I, I can relate to that. Thank you, Becky. So actually related to Becky's question, I have one more question for Devin and uh, Carol. So when we talk about those like monitors or something, so those days I learned we have like, you know, a lot of this kind of develop, development in the biomedical engineering or related field that they have this like wearable devices. They can measure like, you know, your body temperature if you are like in um, like fatigue or, or even uh, disease kind of like, how you say this, um, prediction or like a, if, if they can, someone, you may have to go see a doctor. Do you have like any of those information you want to share with us? The person that I know that works a lot with the wearable devices, his name is Aaron Yoder. And he, again, he's not at our center, but he's at the, the Central State Center for Animal, um, Central States Center for Animal Safety and Health. And that's out of Lincoln, I believe Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, so as part of the University of, of Nebraska, I believe at Lincoln, I can put that in the chat for you too. He has done some work with wearables and he'd probably be better able to, to, um, to answer any questions re regarding those types of um, devices. That's, that, that's great. So those are usually at this moment are still in the research and development stage or we actually could buy quite a few of those at, in, at the market at this moment. I, I think a mix. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I wish I knew more about the wearables, but yeah. In our study, we just kind of asked what types of things people used, um, without saying you should use this. As Dr. Larson saying, I think it's pretty individualized to the situation. Um, but I think Dr. Larson offered some really good advice for how to manage that. And there are like the personal gas monitors that you could certainly wear um, and tailor to your scenario. So that would be something I would be very interested in doing more research on to see, you know, how useful is that when you're applying manure um, as compared to what Dr. Larson talked about with the um, agitation outside the storages, et cetera. Um, but I think, Carol, you would know more about what Dr. Yoder specifically studies with wearables. I'm not sure if there's a specific manure um, management focus to his work. I am not either. I know he there's wearables for almost everything under the sun. All right. Once again, really appreciate our panelists, our speakers, and everyone joining us. This is a great information, a great webinar.